Hey everybody, I'm here with Jason Gruich, who has written two of my absolute favorite action specs over the last few years, uh, and who I've been fortunate enough to become close friends with over the past two or so. Uh, Jason has been a WGA writer for a while now, but he's only been writing full-time for a year. So in fact, we kind of like egged each other on and encouraged each other to take the plunge last year. So he's somebody that I've really shared the journey with. And last but not least, Jason is also the celebrated writer of the Christmas classic, Pups Alone. <laughs> What's going on, man? <laughs> Glad to be doing this with you, man. Um, so uh, this is going to be a fun one because like, I already know a ton about you. Um, and it'll be interesting to just kind of like ask questions uh, where maybe I'll learn new things, um, but also like providing context to everybody that's watching. Um, awesome. But uh, maybe start with like backstory stuff first. Um, what came first, being a cop or screenwriting? Oh, man, that's a good one. So I guess the, uh, I don't know. I've always been a writer. So when I was in elementary school, middle school, I would come home, do my homework and write stories and get my mom to type them out. So I technically, probably my love for storytelling came first. Um, I am a 21 year, you know, uh, resigned last year from the day job which was uh, at the police department i'm a 21 year police veteran i got into that right out of college it was literally i had two friends in college i was like a i was a biology major first i hated that my dad's a doctor i didn't want to be i didn't realize that yeah that's interesting yeah and like after about the first year it was just all the chemistries and the calculuses and i just i was over it after high school and didn't want to do it called my dad and he was like what are you gonna do i was like i don't know uh so majored in psychology enjoyed that and 9 11 um really pushed me into law enforcement i had a couple of buddies that were had screenwriting dreams and wanted to move to la out of college and it was kind of still a pipe dream for me i just couldn't see a path uh, I hadn't broken really out of my shell back in college. So yep. when 9-11 happened and I had a couple, I got robbed uh, at college and a couple other things kind of lined up that kind of called me into law enforcement back in 2001. So right when I graduated, I went straight into that. But I was always, you know, writing little stories here and there and kind of, I guess, subconsciously plotting, you know, a, a push at taking it seriously and kind of moving forward into the professional space. So, okay. So, so you have been doing it for a really long time then for sure. Uh, yeah, I would say, um, I, I mean, I know the moment. It was in 2009. I sat down to write a novel. I got about halfway through it, which became my first screenplay in 2012. I like stopped it for two years because I just, I guess I got bogged down with my first one. It was a ton on my plate um, uh, to write a novel. But I really, the whole point was sell the novel, sell the movie rights, get a movie made. Like that was literally the whole reason I was writing the novel. So interesting. Yeah. yeah, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, uh, bought me Final Draft back then. Like, I forgot what version. It was in 2011. It's Christmas. probably like Final Draft 6 or 7 or something like that. Yeah. It was and a while then, back. Uh, literally, uh, basically took what I was doing with the novel and moved it into a screenplay. And that was my first screenplay in 2012. So that's, that's cool. I really started taking it seriously. Yeah. What was the concept of that one? Uh, so I was a canine officer uh, for about a decade. Yeah. Uh, I worked uh, narcotics, uh, German Shepherd. And so that first movie was about a kind of a Max Payne. Uh, his family's killed and he, he's got to deal with corrupt cops and, you know, gangsters and things like that. That's cool. Okay. Um, did, is that, did you ever like do anything else with it kind of as you kind of started to move into the professional world or is it just kind of sat uh, on in a file somewhere or in a drawer somewhere? Oh, that first script? Yeah. That first script ended up selling to a little production company. Really? But, okay. But nothing, nothing ever came of it. Yeah. And it wasn't a lot of money, but yeah, it ended up getting optioned like a year or two after I wrote it. Uh, somebody found it on, uh, I think it was Ink Tip and hit, hit me up and said, oh, shit. Option it and make it, but it never got made. You know? So this was like what, 2014 or something? 15. Yeah. July 2015. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. So did you always want to like do creative stuff when you were younger, like a kid, high school, middle school, whatever? Or? Yeah, I mean, I played, so I, I dabbled into everything. Like, I was, I played baseball seriously until I was about 21. I had Tommy John surgery. So, baseball yeah. was kind of my main thing. But always on the side, I was doing, uh, like, I was in the talent show every year. You know, it was cringe. But we won in fifth grade. We did uh, Annie Get Your Gun. Me and a, a girl teamed up and did a whole dancing routine nice. in fifth grade. It won, won the city talent show. So, yeah, I mean, I was always, like, I was in, the, I was Santa Claus in the third grade, um, uh, 
play, you know, when I was in elementary school. So I always enjoyed getting on stage, you know, performing, writing stories, getting people's attention, getting a reaction. I was always drawn to that, you know. That's cool. Um, how, so how long was it like, I mean, it's interesting. So you, you wrote your first thing, kind of started, I guess you said 2009. It didn't actually become a script until 2011, 2012. But then just like a couple of years later, you were you optioned it. Um, it. Did you feel like at that point that your work was ready for Hollywood or were you still kind of like, did, did you feel like you were still learning at that point? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I never, like looking back, I never thought I knew it all. I still don't. I'm still learning. I sure. love yeah. picking up new techniques and things like that, but yeah, back then, I mean, I was, I'm from Biloxi, Mississippi. I still live here. It's on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And I knew when I set out on this journey, like to make it in Hollywood, you know, it's like, I didn't know anybody, period. Right. Like Same. Even a friend of a friend of a cousin that even had a, any kind of connection to Hollywood. So yeah, I thought at that moment I was big time and, uh, you know, things were about to happen and yada, yada, yada. But, you know, you come to find out real quick it's it's a much different journey than you have in your head totally yeah i had many of those along the way i yeah. know that feeling completely um so like you were but you were putting it on ink tip because you were like okay i think this is ready to like be seen and it's ready for the world like sure yeah 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 okay. like i put like the very first thing i did was put it on uh the blacklist back in 2012 and wow got, interesting okay yeah and i spent i mean i mean i did a blanket effect and i don't recommend this but I mean, I had, you know, I was working a full-time job. I had some money saved, so I had some money to spend. And that was the only way that I really knew how to make an impression with anybody that was, in, you know, even Hollywood adjacent or in the industry. So I put it on the blacklist and it got some sixes and sevens and eventually it got an eight or a nine. Put it on ink tip. I put it in a contest or two. Like I looked for any avenue I could find to get it out there, get it read. I mean, I would buy coverage from some of these coverage services. Yep. Just hoping the reader would be like, I want to pass this on to someone. You know, that was really the goal, but, you know. Yeah, I think a lot of people do that, too, where, like, they're like, oh, I know if I, like, pay for this coverage service or whatever, like, that's going to, yeah. like, get me a read with somebody who could pass it to somebody. Yeah, no. it's like, let me blow their mind and they'll stop what they're doing, quit their job right. and pass it to their, you know, executive friend. Yeah, totally. Um, It's interesting that you used the blacklist all the way back then. I forget that it was a thing back then because, like, 2012 was when I broke in the first time and like, it was just kind of like brand new that it had become a service around that time. And yeah, I didn't need it then. And so I didn't use it for the first time for myself until I was trying to break in again in like 2021. Um, so to me, it was like a very different experience. Like it was like, by the time I came back to it, it was like very firmly established as like something everybody right. was doing. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I, you know, I would still, I still would send stuff in over the years, you know, it's, it's all a hustle. So like, I'm, I'm, I'm of the mind. Oh, you live and you learn. So you try things If they don't work. You stop doing them or you, you tweak it, you know? So I'm always looking for any kind of avenue to get somebody to read it. Yeah. I mean, you got to try a little bit of everything. Like you can't be stupid about it and throw your money away. Yeah. Um, sure. And like, you, and like the contest and services stuff is like a, a, that, that represents like a fraction of people who actually break in, but, Absolutely, like, yeah. but yeah. it's like, some of them are viable and it's worth trying them as long as you're not going into debt over it or some shit. Absolutely. Um, yeah. how do you think like living in Mississippi has affected your writing ambitions? Like both, like when you were starting out and even up till now. Um, uh, I love it. I think it's benefited it honestly, because I mean, I've been to LA several times, meetings, yep. hang out, you know, walk the picket line, all that good stuff. And I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with LA now. And I can't imagine just me personally, I can't imagine living there having to keep up with, you know, the high, all the cost of living and everything while trying to be creative constantly living here. is much more affordable. I was born and raised here. Yep. Um, coronavirus we know 2020 changed the zoom game so you know i have a general later today that i'm gonna hop on right here from my seat which is nice um back then you couldn't, you couldn't get away with that you had to be out there you know but i think it's benefited it being kind of shut away from all the hustle that goes on out in la i think a lot of people would be shocked and interested to hear hear you say that um that's cool i, I love that like you're saying it's benefited it like i don't know if i would say that myself from massachusetts but i especially now, I, I feel like there's a balance there because exactly like you're talking about with like the cost of living, for instance, yeah. there's no possible way I could have quit my day job last year if I was living in LA. Zero chance. Yeah. But because we live here, like 
I could afford to stretch things for a year based on what I made off of aftermath. So Absolutely. it's yeah. a big difference. And I do want to say, um, mainly it benefited me creatively, I, I would say. Like yeah. in terms of networking, which is vital, it's much better to be out there in the sure. middle of it all. You know, you can call people up for coffee. I mean, we have friends out there and they tell us all these stories, going to parties and ball games. And, you know, that's really, it, living in LA provides that networking benefit you're not going to get not living in LA. But creatively, when I sit down to write, like I don't have to worry about any of that other stuff. I can just, I feel like I'm all alone here doing it. And that's how I like to do it, you know. But you did meet people. Like you did connect with people and manage to network, like yeah. just using the internet. Oh, like how, sure. did, how sure. did you do it? Like how, how did how did that work for you? Like, Yeah, so that, I mean, that was part two of it. You know, I, okay, I have a screenplay back when I, I wrote my first one. Now, what do I do with it? Now, do I, I need to meet people? Are there, I didn't even realize there was like that many other writers trying this stuff and it's hundreds of thousands of people. So I got online, <laughs> a lot. went to different peer sites and I was like, whoa, y'all are writing screenplays too. And some are in the same genre. So yeah, I just looked for any kind of, you know, Twitter, Facebook, um, any kind of peer review site. I think Coverfly is the most popular one right now, but I didn't have that back then. It was something yep. different. And, what was uh, what was it back then? I remember like Zotrope was one of the ones. Zotrope like, was one. They had some message boards. And yeah. You could kind of like dabble and see who was writing and you could, you know, just like you do now, script swap. But it, yeah, networking, not living in LA is at, you know, at a much slower rate and you have to really spend a lot of time online to really forge a real friendship with someone other than a tweet or a, you know, I know him from Facebook or I know him from Twitter, you know, but, but I mean, I've um, done it. I've had, I'm sitting here talking to you. We, you know, we have some of them. I mean, friends. yeah, it's kind of like, it is amazing that you can develop like actually like close friendships online now. It's such a weird yeah. thing. It still trips me out. Like, I feel like maybe for like somebody in their twenties now, it's just kind of like that's been the world for a while, but like, yeah. you know, I'm hitting 40 this year. Like, it's just kind of like, it's strange to me that like, it's still strange to me that that's possible, but I mean, totally like, I mean, I have so many like people that I've become friends with over the year, like years, just like you, like where, you know, you, you get to know people and it's cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so like your first break kind of came around with, I guess the ink tip thing with the canine script. Would you, do you consider that like an actual break? What did you feel like you had broken in at that point or was that not till later? Um, I mean, at the time, I felt like I had broken in, uh, the, you know, the producer of the company, the uh, much smaller company, but they had done some movies with some notable names. And, uh, you know, I had done my research and I was like, OK, we're on our way. But, um, you know, turn no, but, you know, turns out it wasn't breaking in in the way most people think of it. Um, and I had to keep going, write more things and find new avenues and make more connections. And it didn't come till about four or five years later, I would say. And what was that when that happened? Uh, so like 2019, I ended up writing another script that sold uh, in 2017 to a small company. It wasn't like a major sale or anything, and it still hasn't been made. But it was optioned for a few years from the blacklist. It, it scored high, and I found it on there. Uh, and that was in 2017, so that was nice to get a, a decent size payday, which was much bigger than the one before. And then in 2019 is when I would consider my break-in, which was I had a script called uh, Cop Cam that was – I put it up on Script Shadow. Yeah. And, and it, it did well. Everybody – I mean, if you're – if you know, if anybody's familiar with Script Shadow, it can be brutal in the comment section and they're very honest about uh, script feedback. And it, it did well. It was like – it was kind of an overall hit. That weekend, it was an amateur weekend where you provide your script and people vote on the log line and, uh, you know, the moderator of the site reviewed it um, and then passed it on to somebody. And I ended up getting repped at Good Fear and it sold two weeks later. Can you, like, describe the day when you sold Cop Cam? Oh, man, that no, so that day. So after I'd been through some hurdles in the past, the years leading up to that, the smaller sales, the you know, the non-starters, the movies getting made, you know, because you hear the same thing from producers. Oh, we're going to shoot this summer. We're going to shoot next fall. We're gonna right, right, right. Those dates come and go. And it's like, man, is it ever going to happen? And so when this happened, yeah, man, it was cloud nine. Um, totally unexpected. I threw it up on a whim, like literally came home from lunch. I was thinking about it at work. I was a supervisor at the time. I had a lunch break and I was like, you know what, instead of eating, I'm going to go home and put it on. It was the last day I could put it on script shadow. And I raced home, wrote up a little blog, a, blo a blurb and stuck it on there. And Friday morning came along and it was posted. And I'm like, oh no, like <laughs> now, now it's real. Like it's out there. And 
um, it just took off that weekend. Like it, it became kind of a hot topic you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday over the weekend. It ended up winning the little, you know, the, it got the most votes for the five log lines the moderator picked. And yeah, that just that, like, I didn't know it was going to sell. I didn't know I was going to get repped out of it. Just that was a, a, a huge thing for me. And the, the following two weeks was just chaos uh, after that. I mean, I got on Good Fear called uh, Chris Bender's company and they wanted to take it out and try to sell it. And they wanted to rep me. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And then, you know, two days after that, I I'm getting emails and calls from the guys and they're like, do you have a lawyer? And I'm like, okay, what's happening? And they're like, well, we think New Line's going to make an offer. You know, we slipped it to them. They have a first slip deal. And uh, I was like, no. So they hooked me up with an attorney and met those guys. And it was all, it was just phone call, phone call, phone call for two or three days straight. Um, called out, you know, I called in, took leave off of work to deal with it all because it was just nonstop. And then eventually they were like, here's the offer. We think it's good. And um, it sold like, and I was, you know, on my way then, you know. Yeah. I mean, um, I, it was a pretty big deal, obviously. Like, I mean, you know, so that was that got you into the guild, right? Yeah. So that deal, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was a guaranteed. It was a step deal, one step rewrite, and there's two additional steps in it that were optional. But yeah, it was a it was the purchase price, and then the first guaranteed rewrite is what got me into the guild. All right. So and then like and obviously like you know it was uh, it was a sizable chunk of money for somebody who had never done that before. Like, but that, you yeah, didn't that paid it. That payday has lasted me till today. I mean, yeah. I've, we've kind of lived off of that chunk of money from 2019, you know. It's, that's crazy. Um, but you didn't quit your day job, like, yeah, after see. that happened. So how come? Man, that, that's another great question, because that was the moment where it was, oh, now I can, it, it wasn't, all right, so everybody has a different, I guess, barometer of what's quit your day job money or what success may yeah. be. For me at the time, I was like, my wife was still working, making, she was a nurse, she's a nurse still. Um, and at that point I had like, I guess I had 17 years in and I was a Lieutenant at the PD, you know, I had a shift. I was over a couple of departments, crime scene unit, evidence unit. Um, and it was just like, I guess it was wait and see, let's wait and see. And, and I basically came to, the, I'm rambling, but basically I came to the decision I'll do this until it makes sense not to, you know, and um, lasted four more years there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that's pretty interesting because it's like, you know, I I didn't quit too long after selling Aftermath. I mean, I did do it based on the idea that the movie was going to be coming out. So I guess there's that. Yeah. Although obviously that turned out to be wrong. <laughs> still oh, don't, yeah, yeah. can't predict anything. Still don't even have a release date on it. Um, but, uh, you know, like, what are you going to do? Um, but, like, it's interesting to me that, like, you waited that entire time and, like, we're really quite responsible, like, with that money and, like, just continuing to, like, work away at your career. Um, and when, like, when did Pups Alone come into all of that? Oh, yeah. So I skipped over that. That was, so the guy that uh, optioned the very first script I ever did, we, I was I was helping him with some stuff he had, some scripts. He wanted to do rewrites. I was doing a bunch of free rewrites, you know, on little action things that he had. And he just hit me up one day and, like, he knew my lane. And, like, I love to write the cop action, gritty crime thriller you know, big action stuff. And he, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is like, I read your scripts well before I ever like took a look at your movie. I took a look at it, because <laughs> yeah. I wanted to watch it with the kids. Right. And it's just so funny to be like, yeah. this like, you know, silly kid oriented, like um, Christmas movie, like from the guy who wrote Heist Town and right. Final Morning. Yeah. And like, you know, so. yeah, he, I mean, he, it was like a random call. He, I guess he had, you know, I guess on, in the producer space in whatever capacity, you know, you find, you, you get, you get a, you know, you get a, I, I've got access to money now. I've, I've got this much money. I've got this actor. I can do this right now if you want to do it, you know? And that's kind of how it was. He hit me up and said, Hey, I want to do a talking dog Christmas movie. I thought he was joking. I was like, okay, funny. Ha ha. He's like, no, I'm serious. Do you want to write it? And, uh, you know, we can get Dolph Lundgren. We can get Danny Trejo. Like we got him. We just need a script. And I was like, I guess. And then, uh, <laughs> So, you know, I and I hadn't had a movie made or and I was at the time, you know, you take whatever opportunities you can do and totally when they when they show up. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was done on a shoestring budget. It's a fun little movie. Um, but yeah, that's how that happened.
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just it's it, it is wild though, considering like what you normally write. Like it's, it's yes, total, so, total um, but you but know, yeah, my mom is like uh, she always says, you know, one day you're gonna write me a happy ending, and I guess that that counts because it was a fun, feel good movie. You know? There you go. Yeah, I mean, uh, like of course you take any opportunity that comes your way, like something like that where it's like basically ready to go, and and they're offering to pay you to write the script and yeah. get it done. To, you go for it. Um, yeah. Our buddy Joe Marino uh, is doing that type of thing yeah. right now, yes. and it's working out well for him. So, yeah. um, we could say yeah. more about that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, don't know. I think I can. I think I can say that. Right. Like so. Yeah, that's but that's probably He's about it. Happening. So it's. But it's cool. Um. So, like, how would you say the quality of your writing compares now to to like when you first sold cop cam like when you kind of consider to be the time when you first broke in oh uh, vastly different like i'm so i'm constantly reading i'm constantly trying to get better I'm, as we all are but yeah looking back at old scripts like i'm I'm doing a script right now that, that was from the year before cop cam it popped back up with some interest and going back through that script i'm just like jesus like what was i thinking like just I don't know. I think a lot of writers do. I've heard writers talk totally. about that thing. And it's, yeah, you can tell, like, you know exactly what moment in your life you were at when you were writing that thing. And that's, it It just sticks out like a sore thumb. It's like, man, the style's different. The language is different. The vocabulary is better now. You know, it's like, you're constantly growing. And that's how I like to stay. Because I don't want to, you know, if you met me last year, I'm a different person than I am today. Like, that's 100%. just how I think of it. And you know, beliefs change, feelings change, and the writing, especially if you're doing, if you're doing enough reading and writing, you know, your writing is going to be, it's almost like um, a used car, like buying a car, you know, how a car devalues over time. I think it's the opposite with writing. If you're, you know, keeping up with it. Yeah. And like, to me, I don't know, the idea of not improving or at least changing, like yeah. it, it really Fine. boring. Fine. Like, like, I don't want that. Right. Like I, like, I hope I'm always able to grow, you know? Yeah. And so, and like, so necessarily that means like, you have to accept that, like, you're not as good as you will be someday. Right. Like yeah. no matter what level you're at. Right. Um, yeah. Like for me, um, I have ridiculous expectations that I set personally. So anytime, and it's, it's to a fault really, but anytime I start a new script or a new story, or I think of a new idea, my, like my baseline is this has to blow everybody's mind twice, three times as much as the last thing. And I, and I rarely achieve it. I, you know, it, it never, it, you know, some people don't even care. It's like, but, but that's the mindset I have going into each new thing. It's, I don't just sit down and say, Oh, I have a story about X, Y, Z type it out. Boom. Read it. You know, it, I, it's gotta be like, and, and that's why I'm, I'm turned into a slow writer. Like I used to be super. I was, so I was just going to ask this, putting yeah. that pressure on yourself make it harder to write or like you know does it slow you down paralyze you at all like just knowing that like you're holding yourself to that standard absolutely yeah and well, yeah. when i say slow like i hate using that because i i should say it takes more time and the, the the actual writing the thinking the brainstorming yeah the story breaking the notebooks of just idea 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 running it by all your friends saying hey Dude, does this stuff for sure this? So yeah, yeah. So like back then, I thought speed was more of a you know I need to write fast, show them I can pump stuff out. But you know quality suffers, and learned real quick. No one cares how fast you write. It's uh, it's what you hand them at the end of the day. It could take ten Absolutely. years to get a thing. Hundred yeah. uh, percent. There's a vast difference in the way people respond to stuff based on you know what tier of quality it's at, and like right. it's not worth just cranking stuff out because that's just not going to help you out. Um, what do you think like one or two interesting things like like notable lessons you've learned in terms of craft like over the last five years since you sold cop cam um in terms of craft like are there like one or two things that you picked up as a writer that you're like i'm better at this now because of this or like i do or i've changed my process in this way because it helps me or I mean, nothing specifically sticks out. I'm always like, for me, I'm always looking for creative ways to be visual. I'm mm -hmm. probably like, duh, you know, we're screenwriters, but like, I'm always like, I love writing action pieces, set pieces and sequences like that. And I guess the biggest thing I've learned from cop cam, especially I guess four years ago is making everything cohesive where 
it's not just a bunch of characters who are outside of a bank and then there's a bank robbery. It's like 15 pages ago, this happened and that happened. It led to this and that. And now there's a bank robbery because of the thing that happened 15 pages. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I guess that's probably a bad answer, but I guess I'm just, the, the more cohesive I can make any story, I think that's where I've grown. It's like connecting all the little dots. And I still don't hit every one, man. That's why we get notes and feedback. But I sure. think I'm better at it on the first, second, third draft than I was back then. You know. So you mean just in terms of like, you know, there's like connected tissue like throughout yeah, the entire strip, to like, and it's like just you're better at you know making sure this beat on page eighty one is somehow reflects what just happened on page twenty two or something like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Connected tissue is what I was looking. For. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, I like that answer actually because like there's that's something that I've noticed myself pushing myself to do more in more recent scripts too, like where. You know, I remember, I was trying to, who was this interview with? There was an interview with some pro screenwriter who was saying like how, I think it might've been um, Derek Haas, um, but he was saying like, uh, you know, being humble, obviously, but like, I'm not that good of a writer. All I do is like, when I come up with something that I'm like, oh, this is pretty good. Then what I do is I go back and I set it up so that suddenly you think it's great. Like, yeah. you know, and so like, I think there's a lot of truth to that where like you come up with like a beat that's like a cool beat in act late in act two in act three, whatever. If yeah. you go back and you just hint at that and set it up somehow so that it feels organic to the story, yeah. like suddenly it goes from being like a cool little beat to something that's like, it feels so intentional and meaningful and like, you know, and the audience appreciates that I think because they feel like they're in the hands of somebody who like knows what they're doing as a storyteller. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. And, so, and specificity on the page. You know? Totally. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like the more, like I'm never satisfied. Like I don't show anybody a draft until I am, I, until I like exhausted myself and I'm just like, I'm done. That's good enough to show like friends until everything is so specific. Like every, it doesn't have to be every single movement, but you know, like you're not getting lost in the story. You can clearly see based on the specificity of the writing the action unfolding, the character development unfolding, you know, and what leads to what. And I, I think that's overlooked a lot because people kind of rush into the, they think in acts instead of like, and I used to too, you know, like save the cat, all that stuff, you know. I mean, you got to start somewhere and it makes sense yeah, to start yeah. like on a broader scale and you just kind of like narrow, narrow in, right? And so 100%, you get, but yeah, you know. yeah. And then, but, but the thing is, you, you know, you need to break out of that, throw, throw the book away and then like do your own thing. And don't worry about if people says, well, that first act is too long. I mean, maybe it is, you know, but I'm saying tell your story and then you can go back and figure out the best way to shape it and figure out what it is, you know? Yeah. Um, when I was doing that re-entry series, um, like it's almost four years ago now, it's crazy. But um, like Malcolm Spellman, like was yeah. kind of digging into me, like saying like, you got to throw away the pay the writing to page count thing. You cannot yeah. let that get yeah. in, in that. You can't let that get in your head because like, the you might need to write seven pages to come up with three good pages but if you don't write all seven of those you're gonna uh -huh. miss that line at the bottom of page seven that makes the entire scene work uh -huh. because you because you forced yourself to write it in three so yeah. write whatever you need to write and then go tighten it later on you know so uh -huh. yeah. and like i i've really tried to take that advice to heart ever since then because i think it's really good advice it's great advice i mean i i think I think there's a common fear, especially like with newer writers. I know I had it, which was uh, facing a rewrite, you know, like, because I, I remember when I wrote my first or second one, I, I was hoping the first or second draft would be good enough, sell it, done. I right still now. hope that. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Never happens. Know, but... somewhere deep down, we all really hope this is <laughs> there's no notes. Like everybody wants to hear that. Totally. But, but I think, um, but yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, you have to, if you don't sit, the last script I wrote, Heistown a few years ago the first draft of that was 143 pages and I knew it was over I mean I, I had no intention of that being the final draft it was like yeah. I wrote every scene to completion overwrote it you know and then went back and trimmed all the fat and you know cut a bunch of stuff but yeah you got to write the thing to know what you have and then you can go play with it yeah no it's, it's totally true um but and like and it does usually take a lot of drafts to get there yeah. at least you know, I, that's something I think I'm learning more and more as I become like more of a professional writer is like, I, I'm getting more comfortable with the idea of like, okay, like more drafts is the thing. Um, yeah. 
which like I think that was a little bit of a pride thing I had to get over because for a while it was like I shouldn't need to do more drafts if I'm a good writer, right? Like I should be yeah, able to yeah, yeah. If I'm good, three or four drafts should be good enough. And like that was usually like my standard three or four drafts. And like then I'd feel like, okay, you know, people are digging this now, it's ready, right? But like what I've noticed is when people really start responding to my work, it's because like I keep on going back and like you know, and it becomes eight, nine, ten drafts, right? And it's like, yeah, it's a lot of work to get yourself there. But like, like you were saying, like all people care about is the quality of the thing that you send them, and it yes. makes such a difference. Yeah, and that's the thing too. Like, I've I've also back to that question of what I've learned craft wise is not to limit my thinking and I guess be more fluid with the yeah. process. And st- like you were saying, like we all have an idea of what the page count's going to be, right? It's like 90, 100 pages, whatever. But it's like, I don't, I'm not thinking as I'm telling the story, I need to hit it by this page. I'm just writing it. And same thing with acts or, you know, whatever the reversal, whatever the situation may be, I've learned to be more fluid as the process unfolds versus Mm -hmm. like you were saying about your three or four drafts and you're good, like same thing. Hopefully I can write one or two and be good, but I'm not thinking that. I'm like, I know this is probably going to take 20, I hope it's maybe one, but I'm going to see what happens and we'll just keep going back to it, making it better, tightening it up, enhancing it, taking oh. ideas further, you know? Yeah, no, it's great. And I, I've seen you do a, that a lot over like even the past like year and a half that we've kind of known each other really well with like, you know, can I talk about titles of your scripts at all? Or like, so, uh, yeah. it, it, so like Heist Town, like I read that when we kind of first like started um, talking and stuff and blew me away. And I think you've done at least four or five drafts on it since then. I haven't read it since then. I have the newest one in my uh, pending file. I haven't yeah. touched it. But, uh, you know, it's so interesting to me because, like, I loved that script and to the point where it was, like, inspiring my own writing. And it's pretty cool that you were, like, you know, completely open to pushing it further. And you think it's better. That's really, really yeah. interesting. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we hooked up with the director last I'm going to say, oh, I forgot when it was. Right before the strike happened, April, I guess, last year. And that's when kind of the four, five, six drafts after that came. Um, He had really good, he's super creative, uh, love him to death. And every it was one of those, you know, you're taking notes. And the producer, who was still on for two years before that, was yeah. giving notes and good development ideas. And it was really, it's really encouraging when, you ha- when you're working with people who are focused on, taking whatever your ideas are and seeing how much you can squeeze out of it, you know, to make it the most compelling, the most interesting, the most entertaining. And that's kind of what happened. And every time we would have those sessions, I came away with them, you know, for the most part going, wow, I should have, why didn't I think of that? First of all, you know, totally, like, totally. I'm glad you're on my team, buddy. I'll have you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Time. It just, you know, it's just like, makes you look better. So, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's great. I, I totally agree with that. Um, So like, if you moving on to kind of like present day, um, yeah. you have one sentence to describe what life has been like since you quit your job to go full time. Um, so go for it. One sentence. Yeah. Uh, never a dull moment. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. At least you got bored. Well, I mean, it's always been, you know, obviously doing anything creative full time is a challenge. Um, um, you know, unless you're just rolling in the dough, but I've been fortunate enough to at least have this opportunity for this first year. And I've made the most of it. I've, I've got three or four projects. I've done multiple, multiple drafts. Um, you know, and you don't have, you don't have the, you can focus on the creative only. You're not worried about going to the day job eight to five or whatever it is. And then it's, you know, you got this and this and this to do. Then your family wants to go eat dinner one night. And then it's this, you have the job. It's you sit down, you think all day, you may not write anything. Um, you may think about it all day, or you may take some notes in a pet, but it's been fun to be able to fully immerse myself and waking up with nothing else on my mind, except, the, you know, the necessities for my family and then sitting down and focusing yeah. on whatever projects. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty special thing to be able to do. Um, and, it, and you can jump on meetings at any time, you, can, you know, have a zoom right now at noon. On a yeah. Tuesday. Right. It's like, I mean, like, it, yeah. I used to have to like when when I did interviews in the past, I used to have to plan them out like two or three oh, weeks in advance. Time. Yeah. You know, and now it was like this morning I was like, hey, you wanna wanna jump on an interview and like do this thing yeah. for YouTube? And it was like, all right, let's do it. Yeah. Um so like having that flexibility is 
amazing. And also why, like when I was looking for jobs a couple months ago, before these new gigs came in, um, you know, I was looking specifically for stuff that would be that flexible because I, yeah. I know how important it is in order to be able to do my job as a screenwriter. And like, you know, um, I say that as I know a lot of aspiring writers are watching this like, well, fuck, I like, I don't have that flexibility. But, you know, we both figured it out before we had that flexibility too. It was fine. It's just, it's yeah. nice to be able to have more of it for sure. Um, yeah, and that's that's the other thing is like, you know, this has just been, you know, the first year of being able to do it full time. Before yeah. that, since, you know, 10, 12 years before that, it was... Yeah make it work when you make it work you know yeah man i mean you're I'll you're night sometimes they would switch me in the middle of the month to day day shift and then i would have to flip my writing schedule because now i have to pick the kid up from school and go to soccer and this that and the other so yeah i mean you learn to deal with it if you really want to do it if you really want to be a writer or any kind of creative it's you figure out when to do it you'll do what you want to do you'll make time to do it and yeah i mean just like me you're you're a dad full-time job living in a different state you know i mean like those are three strikes against you, but you figured it out and made it work. But, you know, I mean, we talked a lot about how we approached it in similar ways where we would literally both write on all of our lunch breaks and things like yeah. that. And like, you know, we just, we figured it out. Like, yeah. and that's kind of what you have to do. Um, yeah. So sure. if, if you want to do it, because I mean, there are just, as you said, there are so many people trying to do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, what surprised you most about living as a full-time writer this past year? Man, the, the, so honestly, the best thing out of it is being with my family every step of the way. So like, I pick the cool. kid up, I'm, uh, I drop him off, pick him up. You know, I, I don't miss soccer games. I don't miss holidays. I don't miss stuff that I've missed for the first 21 years of, you know, like my wife's pretty much been with me the whole time that I was a cop. Um, so that's been the biggest thing. I know it's not writing related, but that peace of mind for me does transfer into my creative space. If I come home stressed out and, you know, he want, you know, you have to be there for your family too. And then it's like, okay, I have this two hours to write. You're just done. You're exhausted. You're tired physically, mentally. And it's like that day you're like, okay, maybe tomorrow. And then tomorrow it's the same thing, you know, and then the next day. And then like, now you have like two hours on a Saturday every seven days and it's just, you're not getting anything done. So that's been the biggest having peace of mind uh, mentally you know, on the family front has trend for me has transferred into being much more creative and productive. Yeah. I totally feel that it's, it's, I'm, I'm super grateful for that family time too. I mean, just cause like, you know, you, you were all like burning the candles at both ends all the yeah. time. Before, right. So, yeah. and like, and also I had a job that often like required me to be out in evenings or whatever, or like I was always picking up the phone for clients on the weekends and like, plus like trying to squeeze in writing wherever I could. So yeah. no, it's really good to have that time. And that, and that was the thing too, because when you're working and we all do it, every, you know, everybody's got to provide and have a roof over their head and everything like that. But it's like when you're spending all your energy at work uh, at any kind of job, then you come home and you're like, Hey guys, I can't do this thing we planned for Saturday. Cause this is my writing time. If, if that's how you want to approach it, man, and the guilt is just like, there's no guilt. There's no guilt being able to be this flexible, but at the time you have to, you have to fight through that guilt. You got to fight through all of that just to get, any kind of time to do anything, you know, creatively. All right. So you're, you've been living the dream for a year now, um, which is amazing. And we just got through a strike. Uh, you actually are guild. Um, and everything you're seeing in the media or on Twitter or whatever um, is like bleak, bleak, bleak. Like every, like the industry is dead, blah, blah, blah. That's what everybody's saying. What's your take on that? Me personally, I find that all very humorous. Um, there's some truth to it, I'm sure. Look, it's always been bleak. Like being creative and trying to be, think back to when you were a kid or in high school and you told somebody you wanted to be an actor, you know, or a professional baseball player for me or whatever it was. Totally. Like, professional writer. It's like, you know, you get the look. It's like, all right, dude, but what are you really going to do? Like, what you right. Doing? Yeah, totally. You know? And so, yeah, I mean, there's up and, you know, there's ups and downs and swings in the business. It's, you know, People are buying now. No, they're not. You know, are they going to buy again? It all, you know, it just depends. It's as far as I've, as long as I've remembered it, it's always been a very challenging, difficult terrain, but the terrain changes constantly. So it's just, as long as you're right and put stuff out there and doing the best you can, that's all we really can ask for and hope for the best. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. Nothing's guaranteed. You cannot predict anything. Anybody who says they can, I don't, I don't, I don't believe them personally. Um, Nobody has the magic wand, you know, it's just yeah. 
pray for that right circumstance at the right time in the industry at the you know I, you know it's just it's all that's that luck factor that people talk about you know you yeah know. i mean there is a luck factor but like it's never going to come to you if you're not like taking yeah yeah like yeah, not just scared. taking action but taking like like real action like and working really hard toward it you know yeah um, if, you're, if you're always out there and always like you know in the weeds with meeting people and writing and having all the stuff ready to go when, when something pops up and it's like hey so-and-so was looking for this or that or wanted to meet a writer who did this you're ready and that's your luck it's like oh wow this happened because i met so-and-so at a bar in austin at the film festival and now we're having a conversation about a script from five years ago it's you know yeah no i i totally agree and like and obviously like you have some stuff that seems to be going right now um and the, no there are no guarantees and there's a luck element but like you have a meeting this afternoon I've got a pitch this afternoon. Like, I mean, yeah. like, it's like, it's not, it doesn't feel dead. Like it definitely, like I get why people are stressed, but I don't know. It doesn't sure. feel. Yeah. And, it doesn't and there's feel different dead. versions of that too. It's like, okay, so they're not buying, you know, studios haven't bought a hundred scripts so far. So it must be dead. Like there's different ways of looking at there's, I mean, conversate, like you said, conversations are happening. Meetings are definitely happening. Yeah. People are reading scripts. People, people are, are reading around to exact, you know, People like, are getting repped still, you know. It's, why, like, right. Like, why would they be reading as much as they're reading if, like, there wasn't an intent to do something, right? Sure. And, like, yeah. it'd be a waste of their time. Um, yeah. So how do you stay focused uh, now that you don't have, like, somebody cracking the whip? Uh, I, well, you kind of, like, I've never been one. I've never been. I'm more drawn to chaos in terms of routine than I am like actually sitting down eight o'clock gym, nine o'clock, right? 10 o'clock breakfast, whatever it is. I just kind of, I try to get my writing done in the morning. That's when I feel most creative. And then I'll go to the gym right after that, pick the kid up from school. I'll do it for a few more hours in the afternoon. And um, I, I guess the answer I have is I just, I, I try to stay fluid and just not pressure myself into a hole where, you know, if you don't get something done in these two hours between eight and 10, you're a failure. And then, yeah. then I'm pissed the rest of the day. Like person, like now I, that was my time. Now I'm screwed. Now everything else suffers. The time with my wife, my kid, whatever it is. Cause I'm always thinking about what I could have done. And, I have that happen sometimes too. Like I'm really trying know, to like, the more fluid you can make it, like yeah. it'll get done when it gets done kind of mindset. Um, at least for me, that's what's helped. That's, that's actually a really interesting take. I think it's probably a positive one. Yeah. Um, now, granted, if I'm getting paid and there's a deadline, you know, that's much different. <laughs> but, but yeah, if it's spec stuff and, you know, stuff you're working on that's not on a deadline, you don't have to give yourself a deadline. If there's no deadline, it's, you know, it's done when it's done. So you made a big change in the last year. Um, you changed management. Are you comfortable talking about that at all? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty common. I mean, we know that's common. Yeah. I think you've been through a manager or two yeah <laughs> yes as um, you know yeah yeah i mean like you know in nothing against my no, yeah, management yeah, like yes. um but it was it was a fit thing and i feel really good about having made that move so yeah same same with me like uh the guys over at good fear scott stoops chris bender jake wagner was there at the time they were wonderful people um you know kick ass i mean i was with them for three or four years uh jake ended up going out on his own but i was with scott stoops from, yeah from the cop cam sale till right when the strike was about to end last year. And we just had a phone call over a new spec I wrote. And we, I had, I had written the two or three since cops cop cam and he never really quite got on board with any of them, which, you know, I love, I thought they were good. Uh, but it was always like, what's next. Let's work on something next. And, you know, he read like my latest spec late last year and we just had a phone call and was like, you know, let's kind of recap and feel this out, see what we're doing here. And, it was a really amicable, like, you know, I wish wish you the best. And we decided to yeah. part ways and remain friends and all that good stuff. It was nothing. You know, I'm sure there's horror stories with people leaving their managers, but not with good fear. It was fine. Um, it just wasn't, it wasn't the best fit for all parties involved. And it, sometimes it takes a year or two or three to figure that out. Sometimes yeah. a lot sooner, you know, um, sometimes longer. But you come to a point, you know, people shift managers, management, representation, and I found uh, my new manager, Nick Light, um, lit right with, like the day the strike ended, he signed me. Um, he's got yeah, we both job. signed with our new managers like within like a week. Yeah, of each pretty close. So. Yeah. yeah, I think we quit our day jobs around the same day. And got <laughs> yeah, we did. Around the same day. Yeah. 
but Nick, yeah, Nick's been great. I've been working with him uh, since late, I, I think August, October, maybe October last year. And uh, much more in tune with each other's sensibilities and what we like to write and movies we like to watch. And, you know, he was a fireman. I was a cop. We have that first responder bond. Um, yeah, which is cool. And he's, you know, we text almost every day. It's It's been great. And I think you would agree that you've got more momentum going than you've had in a while, too. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and and to be fair, you know, I broke in right before COVID, uh, the shutdown. So that was, <laughs> great that time. Was the, it <laughs> so... was the worst. Yeah, it was. I mean, we were out to directors and then, you know, March 2020 happened and it was done. It was like um, everything stopped and everybody had to deal with that, too. You know, it wasn't just me, but it was, you know, a year, a year and a half of that. Then it was like, OK, let's try and move some generals along and let's send this to some more people. And it just never, the momentum never really caught back up. So it yeah. kind of, it felt like the relationship and the, the push kind of stalled, you know, which it happens, you know? Yeah, no, it totally does. Um, but I mean, I think it's awesome that you, cause that's a scary move to make sometimes. I think it's really cool that you, you did. And clearly it's, it seems to be working out really well, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. which is awesome. Um, Cool, man. Um, is there anything else that like you would like to share with uh, writers who might be watching this? Most of whom I would assume uh, maybe haven't broken in yet, although maybe there are some people like us who are kind of like earlier on in, in the stages of being professionals. Uh, I guess the thing that just popped in my mind was don't listen to all the noise. I mean, you know, especially if you're not in L.A. and you're online and that's kind of your involvement in the industry, which is kind of, you know, you're going to hear a lot of people talk a lot of different things that really don't know what they're talking about, but it can get in your head and it can be like, yeah. okay, like you were saying earlier, you know, the industry's dead or this or that, that can affect, if you let that affect you, you're not going to write anything. So I guess I would say, shut all the noise out, put, put your blinders on, sit down, think of your ideas, get something done, and then go back to the noise and figure out how to navigate that. Find who you need to find to get your thing read by the person you need to get read by and go from there. But the noise can kill you, man. If you, you know, if you get sucked into Twitter and Facebook and take it seriously and listen to everything, we weren't humans weren't designed to take a million opinions at five second intervals. You know? <laughs> Thousand percent. So, so yeah, the, the noise um, is not always a positive thing. That is right. definitely true. Um, There's a lot of value but, to be had, but yeah. Just, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of value to be had. There are a lot of good people out there who are, I think like doing their best to offer useful advice. Um, but um sometimes the loudest voices seem to be ones where like you know it's worth taking them with a grain of salt i would say yeah, absolutely yeah so yeah. 